Okay, this is the first section of the Chapter 4 PowerPoint related to uh, physical and chemical change from the Natural Approach to Chemistry textbook. So, in order to understand chemical change, let's review really quickly what physical change was. And remember, that was just a change in physical properties and that is easily reversible. It's not the actual substance that is changing. Okay, chemical change involves changing the chemical formula. We are now changing one substance into another, and that is considered an irreversible change. For example, a candle burning involves chemical change and physical change. Over time, the chemical change will convert the wax in the candle into gases and carbon. If you look directly near the wick, you can see melted wax. Okay, the wax is going from a solid to a liquid. That would simply be a physical change. The chemical change, though, is taking place as we have the flame consuming some of that wax and some of the wick and uh, turning that into gases and carbon. We do see an actual chemical reaction going on where the reactants, the things that are reacting together, are the wax, paraffin, okay, that is wax, and oxygen in the air. And those will make water and carbon dioxide. Okay, energy determines change in matter, and a chemical reaction is just a change in matter. Interatomic forces are forces that are within molecules. They would be the forces that hold molecules together, and they are very, very strong. Chemical changes deal with interatomic forces, so that involves a higher amount of energy. Now, intermolecular forces are different. They are, instead of being within molecules, they are now between molecules, okay? Interatomic forces deal with forces in between atoms. Intermolecular forces deal with forces that are between molecules. Here, molecules are interacting with each other, and these forces are much weaker than the interatomic forces that are within molecules. Physical changes deal with intermolecular forces and those are involving much lower amounts of energy. So chemical changes need much more energy than physical changes. And here's a nice little graphic from your text showing physical changes where we are simply moving molecules away from each other involve much lower energies than chemical changes where we are moving atoms away from each other within a molecule. Here is where we are doing things like breaking bonds. Physical change, we're just moving the molecules around. Okay, very different. So as we saw before, atomic structure, uh, where the structure of atoms are, are not simply just these little balls. We know that there is a nucleus, and that nucleus is surrounded by an electron cloud. The nucleus contains almost all of the mass, because the protons and the neutrons reside there, and the electrons don't have very much mass at all. So even though we tend to draw atoms as balls or think of them as spheres or, or use the models in class. Um, that's not what they actually look like. It's just representative. Okay, The nucleus is, in reality, a very, very teeny tiny part of the much larger atom. The nucleus is very small and very dense. And then the electron cloud is this area around the nucleus where we're likely to find electrons. It is an imaginary surface. We'll talk more about that in chapter 5 as well. 
electric charge. There are two kinds of charge. We can have positive charge and negative charge. And we know that opposite charges attract each other. So positives are attracted to negatives and negatives are attracted to positives. Like charges also repel. So two positive charges will repel each other and two negative charges will repel each other. Okay, and it's important to keep these things in mind when we're talking about protons and electrons. Protons have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge. When we look at things like bonds, okay, they are created by electrons. It's not just simply a stick that we put in between the two balls, okay? They are created by electrons, and we can have two types of bonding. We can have sharing of electrons, and we can have transferring of electrons. You need to know what those two types of bonds are. There is covalent, where electrons are shared, and there is ionic, where our electrons are transferred. One will transfer electrons to the other, and these are formed from ions. Covalent bonds are the strongest chemical bond. And this is where we have electrons that are shared. For example, here if we look at the water molecule, we can see that there are hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom. The hydrogen and oxygen on one bonded pair will be sharing electrons, and the other hydrogen and oxygen on the other bonded pair will also be sharing electrons. This is how molecules are created. Molecules are created with covalent bonds. It makes them very stable. We can have double bonds and triple bonds depending on how many electrons will be shared between the atoms. Ionic bonds, on the other hand, are much weaker than covalent bonds and they are created when electrons are transferred. Ions are held together simply by attraction. They are opposite charges, and it's called an electrostatic attraction. It is not forming molecules. Molecules are only formed by covalent bonds. Please ignore that five, that's a typo. So ions are held together by electrostatic attraction. Opposite charges attracted to one another. For example, salt is an ionic solid, sorry. Salt is an ionic solid consisting of many ionic bonds in between the ions. The sodium ions are positively charged, the chloride ions are negatively charged, and so they are attracted to each other. And these uh, series of attractions are what will hold something like a salt crystal or any ionic solid together. So then we ask ourselves, why do chemical bonds form? And it's simply because everything seeks stability. Okay, so the lower energy we can obtain equals the more stable a substance can be. So sometimes bonded atoms are simply more stable than lone atoms. Again, returning to water as our example, the energy level for oxygen and two single hydrogen atoms not bonded together, just floating around, we can see, is at this level. Okay, And if we start at a zero level, we can see that the energy is much lower once our atoms have been bonded together. So again, why do chemical bonds form? Simply because it gives them a lower energy state and it makes them more stable. Reactivity. Some elements are very reactive. They will form compounds easily and they're rarely found in elemental form. For example, all of the group one elements are very reactive. Some elements, 
do not react, and they never form compounds. They're only found in elemental form. And an example of that would be the entire last group of elements, those elements that are on the far right hand of the periodic table, that very last column. So we see this disparity. The very first group all the way on the left side is very reactive. And the last group all the way on the right side is not reactive. Well, we can actually use the periodic table to help predict reactivity, which is a good thing. Okay. Again, here we can see that first column is very reactive. Okay. The last column is non-reactive. Apart from that last column, you can see that the first one and the second to last one are very reactive. Then as we come in, they're getting less and less reactive as we approach the middle of the periodic table. But notice that everything is in the red or purple range, very reactive to moderately reactive, with one exception, and that is this last group of elements, which are very non-reactive. And you're going to learn why. You can also predict bond types using the periodic table. Covalent bonds, remember those very strong bonds that create molecules, are formed between two non-metals. Ionic bonds, on the other hand, again those weak ones that are simply an electrostatic attraction, are formed between a non-metal and a metal. So you can use your periodic table, keeping in mind where the metals and the non-metals are, and be able to figure out if a compound is covalently bonded or if it is uh, an ionic bond. For example, let's look at magnesium chloride. Here is magnesium, here is chloride. Metal, non-metal. So this must be an ionic bond. Or carbon dioxide. Carbon, non-metal. Oxygen, non-metal. Two non-metals, this must be a covalent bond. And that will do it for the first section.